So we are, uh, regardless of where I'm at today in my notes, we are going to be done today with the third of the core four, uh, which is um, the defense in defense of or the apology or the apologetic for uh, suffering for the sake of Christ or righteous suffering. And uh, we laid a, a really strong back foundation last week uh, from our, our text in First Peter chapter 3. We're going to go back to that, but last week I, I um, didn't get to share a few verses, actually four. Two of them are from Peter's letters, uh, and then one is from the Apostle Paul in Romans. Uh, actually, both of them are from the Apostle Paul, one to the churches at Rome and the other to the Philippians. So I'd like to see if... Ashley, if you could get us back to the scriptures that were, the, were the, that were at the end of last week. And I'm going to read through those. And then we're going to begin um, today to finish this passage uh, in chapter 3 from, from Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, these are verses 19 through 21. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Isn't that interesting? And Peter is writing and trying to encourage people who are moving into a phase of intense persecution for their faith. And he's not trying to say, look, we'll figure this out. We'll find a way to get out of this, right? He's not saying that. He's leveling, he's leveling the obstacles before them that would get into their mind, into their heart, and would cause them to be weak in their faith. And he's saying, look, for this you have been called. We haven't just been called to a life of pleasure and comfort and leisure in our journey of faith. But according to Scripture, part of our calling is to endure hardship for, righteous, for righteousness' sake. Can you say amen? amen. He says, for, this to, this, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. On Good Friday every year, we carry, someone carries that huge cross in here and we place it in the middle of the room. And before we leave, before the evening is over, each of us take a nail and we walk forward and we put it into that cross. And why do we do that? It's a symbol. But it's a symbol of what? What is it a symbol of? It is a symbol of our responsibility and our sin. Thank you. That we, all of us, you and I, were a part of the suffering of Christ. How many of you can hear me in that today? And so he says, Peter says, for to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you and some of us were responsible for it. Leaving you an example in his suffering that you might follow in his steps. So this is the calling. And Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Part of our cross, you cannot carry the cross without enduring some suffering. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, we shift to the Apostle Paul, and he writes and says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces 
hope. Everybody say hope. And hope does not put us to shame. This is not a game. Our hope in Christ is significant. The Word says that without the hope of heaven, all would be most miserable. It's hope that helps us face tomorrow. It ho it's hope that builds our faith. It's not always going to be this difficult. It's not always going to be this hard. It's not always going to hurt like this. Every time I remember this part of my past, it's not always going to carry pain. That's hope. Hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And Jesus said, I send you a comforter. And when he, the comforter, has come, with the Spirit of God, there is hope. Can you say amen? amen. Again, Paul writing in Philippians chapter 3, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything, everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as garbage, rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own. We get stuck there. Sometimes we go about thinking that we're actually really good. <laughs> I don't have a righteousness of my own. Anything that's good in me is because of Christ Jesus who lives in me. The righteousness of God, are we that? Yes, if we are in Christ Jesus. Outside of Christ, there's nothing good in us. With Christ, in Christ, He's the, bran uh, the branch and we're the vine. If we abide in Him and He abides in us, now we're talking about righteous righteousness. But our righteousness is in Him. In fact, our righteousness before God without Christ is as filthy rags. Yeah. So Paul says, I count all things as loss, rubbish, garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith. Faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. Who He is. Not what He does. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. We cannot share. We cannot walk. We cannot live in the power of His resurrection unless we are willing to embrace the fellowship, the joining together of His suffering. Before there was the resurrection, there was the suffering. Before life, there's death. And we say, that's backwards. It's life and then death. No, not in God's processes. Something has to die so something can live. In our world, in our mindset, well, two, two new grandsons in the last couple of weeks. Wonderful. And in human terms and how we look at things, it's like, wow, new life. Something had to die for that new life to start. Maybe it's the fact that parents have said goodbye to their old way of life because it's no longer going to be the same after you have kids. <laughs> Point being that we have to embrace His suffering in order to rejoice in His resurrection. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then we're back to Peter's epistle, chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial 
when it comes to you to test you. Christians, Christians are still shocked when the devil gets after us. That's the time to dance. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I haven't always, that, that hasn't always been my response. You know. But according to the Word, that's our time for celebration. That's our time to acknowledge the fact that we're finally, we're finally connecting ourselves with the heart of God through Christ Jesus. If the enemy is after you, he's after you because you're doing something to shine light on darkness, to expose evil, to redeem that which was lost. And when we're doing that, the enemy is going to get after us. So he says, don't be surprised at a trial. He says fiery trial, which means you can get burned in there. You're going to get, you're, you can get hurt. It's significant. It's there to test you. It's not God testing you. It's the enemy putting you through that trial to see if you will go into a crisis of faith and your faith will collapse and you will give up on your faith and move away from God, your first love. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. I love that that you may rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. There's a revelation of God that we haven't yet walked in, that we haven't yet seen, that we haven't yet, our eyes haven't seen, our ears haven't heard, our words, our mouths have not been able to speak. There is a glory of God that's coming our way. For those of us who will endure to the end, those of us who will stand faithful, in suffering for righteousness sake no we're not talking about suffering because we sinned we're talking about suffering for the sake of Christ for the gospel of Christ for the name of Christ for the glory of God for the cause of Christ for the heart of God but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer as I just said Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. I've heard people say God's judging America. What's going on in our country is God judging the American people. I just think that that's one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard. Uh, we're so enamored with ourselves, that God filters everything that He has planned through the United States of America. I, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Doesn't mean I'm not a patriot or don't love my country. I, 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 I do. I do. I know the Pledge of Allegiance. One nation under God. fly a flag out in front of our church. We're grateful for the freedom that we have to worship the Lord. But I can tell you this. It's for king and then country. So if anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but glorify in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of faith and to conclude that point that I was making about country. I say God is judging America. No, God is judging the American church. I'm, I knew I would lose a few amens there. But the scripture tells me it is time for judgment to begin at the household of faith when a culture and a society that was founded on God and, and the Bible as the moral authority for its society, when you reject, when a church, the church of Christ it rejects, rejects God itself. When we started building churches that became kingdoms of God here on earth, 
kingdoms of men. Then judgment was headed our way. When we look more like the world than we look like the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of God, judgment starts in the household of faith, not out there. And the response, the response that we have is simple. If my people who are called by, name, by my name will humble themselves and pray. He's talking to the people of the household of faith. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to people who are called by his name. He's talking to the Jewish people. How does that connect to us Gentiles in the church of Jesus and a new covenant? Simple because we become inheritors of that covenant through Christ Jesus, amen? And we are part of the body of Christ. Who's the head of the body of Christ? Christ is the head of the church. Now, when I, in my younger days, I was a person who struggled. I mean, I really mightily struggled with, because I couldn't find out where I fit in the church. And the truth of the matter is I wasn't trying to fit. So I struggled. And I had this chip on my shoulder about the church until the Lord humbled me and said, do you love God? Yes, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you love Jesus? I'm trying to every day. I'm trying to love Him. I'm trying to love Him. I'm trying to serve Him. I'm trying to make Him happy. I'm trying, I'm trying to put a smile on His face. I'm trying to live a life that He looks at and says, you know, this is my my servant, my son, in whom I'm well pleased, right? I'm reaching for that. Just like you are. And the truth of the matter is, is that we can't not fit in the church because He's called us to His body, to His church. We can't sit and say, well, I don't, I don't like this version of the church, so I'm going to go start my own. Our biggest goal and part of our suffering that we face, that we face is because we struggle against authority. We struggle against Scripture, which is the ultimate authority, yes? It trumps, sorry, it overrides. Can everybody hear me today? The authority of God's Word overrides the authority of men. When men no longer preach the Word of God, sound doctrine from the Word of God, then they have no authority anymore. They are only speaking in their own voice. They're certainly not speaking for God or His church. So let's move on to today. Uh, I picked out just a couple of small videos because I want to continue to keep this consciousness about the suffering that's going on in our world. And I hope that everybody can understand that this teaching uh, is, is not uh, intended to say, here's what's going to happen. Within the next three or four months, you can expect this, this, and this, and this. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that as a pastor and a person who does believe that the Word of God is authoritative, that it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it is the word of truth. As a pastor, it is my joyful responsibility to teach you the truth that in this world you will have trouble and to prepare you for that kind of trouble with a righteous response. Can everybody say amen to that? So I picked out a couple of videos and I, I'm gonna ask uh, Ashley if she can maybe play uh, the first one of those and then we'll, we'll go from there. After losing a court appeal in early June, Armenian Hakup Gochimayan received a 10-year prison sentence for allegedly participating in Christian activities in Iran, reports International Christian Concern. Gochimayan and his wife Elisa, who is of Iranian descent and has family in Iran, were detained near Tehran in August 2023. In a report from Barnabas Aid, the couple was, quote, placed in solitary confinement and subjected to intense psychological torture, end quote. Hebrews 13.3 says, Don't forget those who are in prison. Remember them as though you were in prison with them. 
and do not forget those who are suffering. Remember them as though you were suffering with them. Authorities in Iran arrested the couple who were in the country visiting friends and family as they dined at an acquaintance's home. Reportedly, the Armenian man had several copies of the New Testament written in the Persian language of Farsi and had attended multiple churches during his stay. In an attempt to dissuade conversions, it is illegal in Iran to speak to non-Christians about the gospel of Jesus Christ and to have Bibles written in Farsi, which is the nation's official language. According to Open Doors, Iran is the ninth most difficult country worldwide in which to be a Christian. Jenny 그리고 우리는 그리스도인이었기 때문에 머나먼 곳으로 추방되었습니다. 이제 결코 도망갈 수 없게 되었습니다. 여기서 일하는 것은 힘이 듭니다. 배급도 충분하지 않습니다. 우리는 항상 배고프고 또 아픕니다. 여기서는 살아남기 위해서 스스로 먹을 것을 찾아 나서야 합니다. 그러나 매일 아침 눈을 뜰때주 하나님의 임재를 느낍니다. 여전히 주의 종으로 섬길 수 있도록 강건하게 하시는 우리 아버지 하나님께 감사드립니다. 사람이 떡으로만 살 것이 아니오 하나님의 입으로 나오는 모든 말씀으로 살 것이라 어려운 기회로 최근에 국경을 넘어 다른 그리스도인들을 만날 기회가 있었습니다 그들은 저에게 음식과 약도 주고 또 주님의 은혜로 성격책도 주었습니다 그곳에 있었을 때더 머물 수 있는 기회가 있었습니다 제가 자유로워질 수 있는 순간이었습니다 그러나 저는 저의 가족과 교회를 저버릴 수 없었습니다. 아무리 작은 교회라도 말입니다. 여러분의 입장에서 보았을 때 우리가 고통당하는 것이 저주처럼 보일지도 모릅니다. 그러나 우리는 이것을 축복으로 압니다. 아버지께로 가는 지름길이기 때문입니다. 그러나 공교롭게도 부탁이 하나 더 있습니다. 우리를 위하여 기도하는 분들에게 우리가 얼마나 감사한 마음을 가지고 있는지 전달해 주시기를 부탁드립니다. 우리는 여기서 건강하게 잘 견디겠습니다. 그리고 북한 땅에 계속해서 주님의 복음을 전하겠습니다. 여러분의 잠에 울림 That brings things to present day. We can't look at Scripture and say, well, the suffering church was 2,000 years ago, and for 300 years, Christians were persecuted by Rome. No, the persecution, the suffering continues. It's just a little bit further away from our front yard, and so we don't see it. We don't have consciousness. It's not to bring us to this 
point of sadness or sorrow. But you looked at this woman, she said, it's not a curse. What did she say? It's a blessing. It's a blessing. I do believe that the American church is headed for a blessing, but it's not going to be the blessing that they thought originally, like materialism and land and a fat bank account. And I think our blessing is going to come in the form of those of us who are going to stand, in our, stand firm in our faith. Can you say amen? amen? That that's where our blessing is going to come from. This is heightened uh, pretty closely for V and I. We, we're, we teach students uh, who are enrolled in fully equipped uh, Bible Institute whose entire families have been murdered. Nigeria, right now uh, what's going on in Somalia, Sudan, Uganda, which I'm heading, heading to in just a couple of weeks. And this is not going to be a trip like I've made to. Can I just tell you, when, I go to, when we go to Zimbabwe, uh, it's a Harare has extreme, extreme pockets of poverty. I don't, want to, I don't want to diminish this, but their entire e economic system is run by the black market, through the black market. Their banking system, their monetary system has collapsed. Even some, a few years ago in 2019, when our mission team went to Zimbabwe, and some of our f folks on our team saw uh, currency on the ground, and they were like, oh, here's some money I just found, and they picked it up, and the people from uh, Zimbabwe were laughing because it's just trash to them, their currency. It means nothing. Uh, my trip, our trips to Zimbabwe were treated as honored guests and we stay in the home of wonderful people, you know, who have jobs and means and it's not a vacation by any stretch. But Uganda, this Uganda trip is not going to be like that. I'm, I'm, I'm going out into the bush. I'm going out into the rural areas, and I have no idea what to expect. I just know that two of the students that I have, two of the students that I have in my apologetics class on Saturday morning, their families have been subject to extreme physical, physical persecution. And it's not far away from our doorstep. And I'm praying that there are, I know that there are more pastors and that there are more teachers and there are more Christian leaders who are waking up to the word of truth that in order to prepare our people for what's coming doesn't mean that we prepare ourselves for this big influx of material blessing. So you want to empty out your church on a Sunday morning to talk about the defense of righteous suffering. <laughs> <laughs> suffering for the sake of Christ Jesus. So Peter has moved to the issue that is central for the rest of this entire letter, as we said earlier. Everybody still awake? Say amen. amen. The issue of Christian suffering, and the issue is, Brian, the issue is, is that we all suffer. If we're going to truly follow Christ, we are all going to suffer some forms of of difficulty, hardship for the sake of Christ. If we're going to truly represent Christ in the way that he needs to be represented, we are going to face some persecution. That persecution isn't always going to come in a public high school. That persecution can come from a Christian high school. Just process that for a moment. What Peter has done to his, his listeners, his audience, is by the power of the Holy Spirit is to show how the love of God turns the problem of righteous suffering upside down. For those who abide in Christ Jesus, Christians are free from the need of revenge and vindication and filled with the power of the Spirit. 
You know, I've always been one who would, you know, you know how we always look back at Bible stories and we always go, well, if I'd have been there, I would have done something different. I can tell you 100, with 100% certainty, I would have picked up a sword and I would have cut the guy's ear off. I would have, that, I would have done it because that's my profile. I'm sorry. For those who abide in Christ Jesus are free from the need of revenge and vindication and are filled with the power of the Spirit, with a genuine humility as benefactors, recipients of God's amazing grace. If that's you, say amen. Amen. Suffering for the sake of righteousness becomes an opportunity to answer evil with good. With good and to answer cursing with blessing. Peter describes the unlimited and miraculous power of a witness of this kind of response in chapter 3, verse 13, when he says, Now who is there to harm you if you are passionate or zealous for what is good? Peter's question simply means that Christians who listen to the instruction of Psalm 34, which we're going to read here, should not go looking for trouble or expecting any harm, but should not be surprised when it comes. We should not bemoan this. We don't text people and just say, hey, I'm really going through it. It's fine to text and say, pray with me. I'm navigating some difficulty. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Are you still awake? Amen. Psalm 34, verses 11 through 18. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Speak peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. Can I start that one again? When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Can I, can I start that one one more time again? Can I say that one more time? When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. He's not far off. He's not on vacation. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in their spirit. So clearly, there certainly is an intensely deeper, deeper truth here regarding righteous suffering that Peter is communicating to you and I or to those who will pick up this letter and read it. Peter is wanting something deeper communicated. He's wanting something deeper revealed to you and I. And as long as we just scratch the surface on the things with the things that make us feel good, we're never going to get a revelation of the things that take us from just feeling good to knowing the full and complete righteousness and holiness of God to truly being in Christ Jesus. It's one thing to be with Him. It's another thing to be in Him. I, 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 gotta, I, I just got to come. I get, you have to hear this point today. It's one thing to be with Him. It's another thing to be in Him. For those who are in Christ Jesus. Find how many scriptures that you can locate. I know some of you have your little smart commentaries on your phones. You'll get that done. Probably get me corrected before I'm done. But I'm not too far off on this. I, 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 I'm not saying I know the Bible, but I kind of know a little bit. A little, just a scratch. Scratching the surface. Hoping I get to know a little bit more before I'm out of here. But find how many passages of scripture say for those who are with him as opposed to the ones that say for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm with a lot of people. How about you? The revelation comes for those who are in Him, not just those that are with Him. 
Peter was with Jesus a lot. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Peter was with Jesus a lot for three years. And yet, when Christ was arrested, on the night that Christ was arrested, he was still just with him. That's why when they asked Peter, don't you know him? He swore with profanity, I don't know this guy. You're mistaking. No, we saw you with his disciples just this past week at the beginning of Passover. That wasn't me. I believe that Peter was with Christ for three years. But I can tell you this, when that rooster crowed three times and he realized what had come out of his mouth and it was the very thing that Jesus has told him he would do and he swore up and down he would not do, he realized that he wasn't in Christ. He was only had been with him. And from that moment on, it was his pursuit to be in Christ because it was only 50 days later that he would stand up on the day of Pentecost and the other disciples would stand behind him and he would proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it would be Peter who at the end of his life said, you can't crucify me hanging right side up. You've got to crucify me hanging upside down because I am not fit to be crucified the way my Lord was crucified. Now he was in Christ Jesus. Many Christians are struggling right now in a cultural crisis of morality and order. Not law. I did not say law. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Many people in our culture are in a crisis. They are struggling. Christians are struggling in this process of where am I? Who am I? I? Am I some freak who's huddled in a corner of a little church? Doubting everything that I believe because we don't have masses of people? It was 48, 48 million people, 48 million Christians who voted Hitler in. Don't trust the masses, trust the truth. Trust the truth. Hear the word. Know the word. Walk in truth. Whether it's you and a thousand or you and one. Right? In Christ Jesus. Clearly, there's something deeper to be revealed to us here. One that goes beyond just be good, do good, feel good. Right? Say that with me. Be good, do good, feel good. Nothing wrong with that, Pastor Steve. What's wrong with that? What could possibly be wrong with that? Be good, do good, feel good. Isn't that biblical? Sure, yes. But the context is beyond be good, do good, feel good. The context is what are you going to do when you are suffering and being called out for righteousness' sake? When the government has followed and created algorithms to know who you are and what you believe in, and when they want to shut down portions of our country who they know will choose God before they choose government. Boy, I'm tiptoeing. I'm tiptoeing, but I'm going to go anyway. I'm going to walk anyway. They know the people in this country who are going to choose God before they choose government. So what are you, anti-government? No, I'm just not anti-God. I'm going to choose God and His Word before I ever choose men and their systems. Always. That's that's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Especially when you're being led by a government who has no, no allegiance to godliness or to God's word. None. Well, this sounds a little rebellious. Yeah, it really does. How refreshing. Amen? It is a truth that both readies and remedies the true believer and obedient follower for the hardship and suffering that inevitably is going to come to those who remain faithful. There's a way out of this. Just deny him. There you go. There's a way out of this. Just say, I don't really know those people down at Reunion. The pastor's a nut. (laughs) 
Peter is tethering his listeners to what Psalm 34 just said. The eyes of the Lord are fixed upon the eyes of the Lord are fixed toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. No matter what we face or go through, his eyes are fixed on us. They remain on you and I. And his ear is toward your cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. To go further with this, the word evil used in the concluding sentence of the psalm that we just read is picked up again in Peter's uh, letter in chapter 13. He's really just quoting this. And the original Greek that he uses for these words is who is there for who is there to harm you? Tisokos haimas, kakos haimas, and all that simply means in its original is who then in the light of the Lord's care and in his control of evil will be able to do evil to you. Now, now it's in this context and it's in under this authority of God's word that you and I now have authority over our enemy, which is the devil. We do not have authority over the enemy outside of God and his righteousness and his word. Our authority comes to those who have surrendered their life and their heart to Christ Jesus, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, you know what? We saw this strange thing. We, we said the same prayer that you prayed, and we laid hands on him, and nothing happened. I remember reading that from the book of Acts. Nothing happened. Not everybody that proclaims the name of Christ is in Christ. I'm really grateful for those who are. And there's a lot of them here in this room today. Let's give the Lord praise today. Come on, let's clap our hands and give Him praise. Now, however, He is most certainly confirming in them that under God's covering, care and blessing, no evil or intended harm can overtake them. Peter's words match the Apostle Paul's creedal affirmation, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, Peter's assurance is also consistent and it is confirmation with King David's proclamation, which was regarding hardship and persecution from the enemies of God. What did he say? He said, in God, I will trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? So the takeaway lesson of suffering for the sake of Christ that we learn from Petros, this series in Petros, even if we face hardship or we suffer for the sake of righteousness, we will not be overcome. We will be blessed. Do you remember one of the most significant teaches, teachings from Yeshua? They call it the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, verses 10 and 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, and when they lie about you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. <laughs> Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those are the words of Jesus. You're not cursed. You're not going to be overcome. You're going to be blessed. Stand firm in your faith, regardless of what comes before you. Don't attach yourself to identity politics. Don't attach yourself to politics, period. Be a good citizen. Be a good person. Pay your taxes. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But above all things, choose the Lord your God. Choose His Word and His righteousness. Right. Amen. Now, to be clear, just to wrap this up today, because I said that no matter where I was in my notes, we were going to be done with suffering, uh, because I don't know if anybody can suffer any more of this. To be clear, no injustice or lasting harm can come against us or our eternal place in Christ Jesus. 
God's vindication and protection will preserve the inheritors of his blessing. You and I are the inheritors of his great blessing. He is going to preserve that. It's his promise. In John's gospel, Christ prayed that the Father would protect his own from the evil one. But he did not pray that they would be taken out of the world. So we've kind of focused or directed ourselves towards the words of Jesus as he forewarned his disciples. You know, we always talk about it here. In this, say it with me. In this world, you will have... Come on, let's try it together. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We're familiar with that. And we focused on that, and we should. The central message of Petros is to those who have begun to discern. Write it down. Put it into your phone. Have begun to discern. You can't discern unless you're in the Spirit. You walk by the flesh, you have no discernment. Yes? There's no discernment outside the Spirit. The central message of Petros is to those who have begun to, by the Spirit, discern and even experience the increasing pressure of evil opposition and hostility in their society. Anybody in this room starting to discern and feel some of that pressure of what's going on in our culture? Raise your hand if that's you. You can discern it. How about in the workplace? Yeah. Yeah. How about in relationships with people that you know and love? I don't know what happened. We were just, we were such buddies and close friends. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? Yeah. The message of Petros is for us. The opposition is there. If you're not being opposed, you must be on the same side. Well, I'm not really facing any opposition. Check your temperature. Why? Because the Scripture says that He wants us either hot or cold. He doesn't want us lukewarm. Check your temperature. Find out where you're at. Find out which side you're on. Find out where you're supposed to be. Find out your place in Him. Find out. Yeah? Do not be surprised. We must also understand that suffering is not simply the opposite of blessing. Paul, let's stand. We're going to... We're... We're done here. I think everybody gets the point, yes? Yes. Yes. How many of you are pretty comforted today knowing that you can stand for Christ Jesus in any setting, in any time, in any place, and He will go before you? He will go before you. You know, I was ready to write off the Olympics after the opening you know, sideshow. But boy, weren't there some wonderful Christian athletes who just represented their faith so strongly and so beautifully? And yet they did that at great risk. How do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about being, you know, persecuted. They're on a high-profile world stage. You know, nobody's going to come after them in that moment. But let's just see what happens in the weeks and months to come for those athletes who specifically, and I'm not talking about, you know, the football players who say, I just want to thank God and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they, okay, your grandmother's Jesus, not yours. I'm talking about people who make those confessions saying, I know my purpose, I know why I'm here. It's not because I'm a great athlete, it's because God wants me to use my witness to represent His kingdom in this world. I'm, people who get it. People who get what the opportunity is about. Because Peter writes, he says, if you should suffer, if you should suffer. When he was writing this, the real suffering hadn't even started. Yeah, they had, they had crucified Christ. Paul had been a part of it. He had been a part of beating and imprisoning Christians. But the real suffering hadn't even started 
How many of you understand that the real suffering hadn't even started? They hadn't even begun to fill up. In fact, the Colosseum at that point, when Paul was writing this in Romans, the Colosseum hadn't even been built. But what Nero started doing was he built the Colosseum around the grounds where he had the tents, where he had the parties. And he burned down two-thirds of his city just so he could blame the Christians. And then he got the funding to build the Colosseum and to pay back the Christians, his hate for Christians, he built the Colosseum so he could march them in before the lions, the beasts, so he could light them on fire, so he could put them in against the gladiators without weapons. I'm not saying we're heading there. Not at all. You'd like to think that we were in a world with more moral judgment. But are we? Are we? You'd, you'd like to think that we would have more moral sense and compassion for other human beings, that nothing like that would ever happen. But yet, I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you, are we? No, I think we're on the same path we've always been. And here's the great thing. The Redeemer, the great champion, our Savior, our Lord, the Redeemer knows He lives and He's coming again. Isn't it odd to hear that on a Sunday morning in a Christian church? That Jesus is coming again? <laughs> so listen, when I was a kid, that's all they talked about. Uh, Gail, we'd put on little skits, you know, uh, at camp, church camp. And because I played the trumpet, I, I don't know, Michelangelo might relate to me on this one, because I played the trumpet, I was the guy in the skit that hid down in front behind the altar. And when they turned the lights out, I would play the trumpet. You know, like the trumpet sounds, right? And it would be a simulated, so everybody would get this, kids, all 16-year-olds would get this sense that Jesus was, you know, it was happening. And kids would cry and they'd run down front. I'd throw my trumpet down and I'd run down there, you know. Lord, save me. I get saved every time. Every t it worked every time. And people say, well, that's silly. I'm really wishing we could go back to silly. Because we don't even talk about the return of Jesus anymore. And when, you stop, when Christians stop talking about the return of their Redeemer, they lose hope. How many of you hear what I'm saying? So let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for our country. It is a great country. Let's pray for our families who the last thing on some of their minds, people that we love with our whole heart, the last thing on their minds this morning is worshiping the Lord. Pray for them. Call their name out right now. Call their name out right now. Say it. Say it. We've got names too, so just say it. Say it out loud. Let's pray for Israel. Call out the name. We pray for the peace, as the Word of God says. Pray for the peace of Israel. Really what I'm praying for for Israel is for His kingdom come and His will to be done. Because that valley is going to fill up and there's going to be a great battle. And the redeemed of the Lord are going to win that battle. And our King and our Lord will lead us forward on a white horse. What are you talking about, Pastor Steve? The Word. Where do you think J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis got all the imagery for all that stuff? They got it all from the Word of God. That's where they were being inspired by. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, 
we the redeemed, we the church, the body of Christ, we hear your call and your cry to us. Make yourselves ready. Know the times, know the seasons that suffering may, camp, may come to us. Father, we don't dread this. We don't look at this with fear because we already know that your word proclaims that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. There is no fear in the child of God. Can you say amen? amen. There is no fear in us today, Father, but there is humility because we want to represent you and we want to give our defense of who we are in you, Lord Jesus. And I pray over my friends and over our church and over our families and over our communities. Save us, Lord. Heal us and prepare us for what's coming ahead in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, 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 and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much.